Hi everyone, and welcome back to the second set of lectures in Introduction to Neuroscience on Sensing and Action. My name is Bing Brunton, and I am a neuroscientist at the University of Washington in Seattle. In the last section of videos, we talked all about the active and passive properties of neurons, how it is they communicate through action potentials passed down axons into synapses, and we talked a lot about neurotransmitter systems and the different types of chemicals that are involved in your nervous system. Now, if you watch those videos in isolation, you'd be thinking to yourself, man, this is super duper complicated. How does this even work all together? So that's what we're going to try to tackle in this next set of lectures by looking at the system as a whole and thinking about not just how each subsystem works, but how they work as a whole integrated together so that each different sensory perception is integrated with each other to generate a set of actions that we use to interact with the external world. Here I'm introducing not just the world as a set of physical objects that you can manipulate, but also other animals and other living things within it. So this could be animals of the same species, animals of different species, things that are inanimate objects like rocks that you can throw or trees that you can, you can, you can harvest. Um, and so this perspective here is not particularly controversial. I think it's, uh, you know, anyone who studies animals will agree that obviously animals actions that interact with the world and then the world and then pushes back in terms of sensory perceptions. But the way that I've drawn this diagram, almost this engineering systems diagram, does emphasize something that I think is really important in this section on sensing and action, which is that this is intrinsically a feedback loop system it is really difficult to dissociate any single action from sensory perceptions. And conversely, it's really difficult to dissociate any sensory perception, any single sensory perception at any given moment from the actions that it eventually elicits. After all, what is the point of sensing the world? What is the point of seeing things and smelling things and, and touching things if it were not to guide our actions either at that particular moment or farther down um, in the future, right? So in thinking about this, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the plan for the next set of lectures. We're going to start by thinking about the organization of the nervous system, because after all, this is now a systems level understanding of the nervous system. We're going to zoom up from the level of single cells and synapses into groups of cells, large groups of cells, and talking about the general organization of the nervous system, because it's not just a blob of cells that are all connected to each other. Far to the contrary, there's a lot of architecture in the way that the nervous system is put together. Along the way, we're going to talk a bit more about methods for measuring and manipulating the nervous system. These are the tools of the trade that the we neuroscientists use to think about how it is the nervous system is put together and what we can do to change it and both changing it in terms of manipulating its function as well as manipulating its function as a way of interrogating the system and figuring out how it actually works. Next, we're going to have uh, use all of those tools and techniques, now that we know what they are, to understand different sensory perceptions and movements and motor control. Like in the previous diagram, instead of having these be completely separate things, we're going to very much talk about each of them each at a time, because it's impossible to talk about all of them together in the same lecture. But we're going to talk about them in terms of how they interact with each other and think about different ways that they are similar to each other rather than how all the different ways that they are different, because they actually do have a lot in common in terms of how the nervous system is organized. So to go back to this picture of an animal acting on the world and the, and the world acting back, um, pushing back on us in terms of our sensory perceptions that we can use to measure the world, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a sleight of hand here. I'm just going to change a couple of words in this diagram, and we're we'll, we'll going to explore what happens here. So instead of the animal, I'm going to call it the agent, and our actions are our outputs, and our sensory inputs are our measurements or our inputs. So again, this is becoming more like what you would think of as an engineering diagram. And the agent here, rather than being an animal, could very well just be a robot of some kind with a computer inside that takes inputs, computes something, and then has some kind of outputs on the external world. In fact, this analogy of animals as if they were little, little machines, little robots, is a very popular one. And it's one that I've actually used and kind of implicitly assumed in the last set of lecture. I tended to talk about um, how neurons were computing, about how axons were like wires. Right? These are all analogies that I used and borrowed from the way that we have engineered computing systems. Now, we have to think about it for a second because is the brain actually a computer? And why does this question matter? So this is an important point, right? We can ask the point and almost, there's not really a right answer for this. If you go on, if you go on social media, there's neuroscientists arguing on a periodic basis. Every year or so, this question comes like, well, is the brain a computer? People say yes, people say no. And there's a really a good argument to be made from both sides. But why does it matter that we either think of the brain as a computer or not? The reason it actually matters is because the mental framework that we use to try to understand the brain, these analogies we use, very much formulates the, what we 
we're looking for when we mean what we understand, okay? So if we think of the brain as a computer, that means when we try to understand it, we're gonna to try to understand it like it's a computer. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a concrete example. Computers represent information as bits, and they have um, arithmetic operations on these bits like additions, okay? So if we think the brain is a computer, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go inside the brain, all of these neurons, and look at the neurobiology of the brain, and we're gonna be looking for how does a neuron represent a bit of information, and then how does it do something about this bit of information like add it? And this is exactly what people have done. People have gone into the brain and characterized how many bits of information a neuron can possibly represent and how does it add, okay? Now, it sounds obvious now that we can do these things, but in fact, if you think about it, computers have not existed for that long. In fact, neuroscience predates modern computers. And so how did people think about brains before there were computers? Now, not surprisingly, people had all kinds of analogies for thinking about computers and for thinking about brains before computers. Descartes had this uh, kind of a water steam engine analogy for, how, for, computer, for, for brains. And he thought that, that there was something called an animal spirit that was driving living bodies like water driving machines. And here, his mental image, instead of being computers, was more like a, a water driven clock or a water driven mill. This animal spirit runs through nerves like fountain pipes and almost like steam engines, and the muscles and tendons are like engines in the springs. Okay? This analogy made use of the best technology they had at the time, and so I think this is actually a really cool thing about the brain, is that the brain is so inscrutable that we almost always have an analogy of the brain working like the most complicated thing that we managed to build at the time. So back then it was, it was a wind driven, windmills and water mills and, and steam engines, and now it's more like computers. Okay. And the reason this matters is because I think if you look at the history of the analogies that we have used in the past to try to understand the brain, it points out that it's likely the case that none of them are particularly accurate. And so I want to think about the brain as a computer. However, I want to remember that we don't want to think about this too literally because the brain is not literally a computer. And we shouldn't be looking for all the different parts that are in the computer because that's kind of a pointless exercise to try to look for bits of a computer that are in the brain because they came about in very, very different processes. And what we can do is then think about how technology, the technology at the time, now I mean both these analogies, in terms of these analogies of what we think of the brain, is it, is it a steam engine, is it a computer, is it something else we're gonna build in the next 100 years, I don't really know. Technology has always framed how we approach understanding the brain. Technologies, the analogies that we bring have framed what we mean when we think about what it means to understand the brain, okay? And technology is also at the core of all of the different ways that we investigate the brain, just like has formed how we investigate every other system in living systems. And so when science continues to generate unpredictable new ideas and opportunities, we, as scientists and human beings, will continue to respond to these new ideas with new skills and inventions. I really love the feedback here, where a lot of technologies have been driven by the need to understand something, but I think conversely, we have to not forget the fact that what we mean to understand something is also driven by the technology at the time. So all of that is a bit philosophical, but let's go a little more concrete first, okay? What I mean here is that technology is something that we really need to pay attention to in launching into this next section of videos because we need to understand what are the technologies that are at our disposal, what are the tools that are at our disposal because that very much limits and frames and also inspires what we can understand about systems neuroscience. This is a diagram from a review paper that Terry Sanowski wrote with a few of his colleagues and the axes here are hopefully a bit familiar to you because I've shown you this before in the intro video, in the overview video video. These are uh, temporal times, uh, temporal time scales on the, on the horizontal axis in logarithmic coordinates. Every tick mark is 10 times longer. And the vertical axis, we have size scales, again, in logarithmic coordinates. And so every tick mark up is 10 times larger. I took my axes from Terry, and so this is the same reason that you're seeing the same diagram here. But in this diagram, uh, what the authors have highlighted, instead of looking at what's happening at each of these spatial temporal scales, are the technologies that are available for monitoring as well as manipulating neural activity at those spatial temporal time scales. And the lovely thing that they've done here, um, they wrote this paper in, in 2014, is that they compared the state of the art in 2014, now we have a bit more than this, from what it was in 1988. 
And I hope what you can see, even without paying attention to a lot of the details, is that our ability to manipulate and record from neural activity in 1988 is substantially more restricted than what it, wa what it was in, 19, in, in 2014. You can kind of imagine this, this, this diagram being a little more filled in now if we try to make another version for 2023. And that is a really wonderful thing. So Terry and his colleagues filled out this diagram where, uh, where they mostly focused on spatial temporal techniques for monitoring brain activity. And I'm attempting to make a slightly more complete but still very incomplete list of all of the other tools that are used in modern neuroscience. So these are tools that you might hear about if you went to a, um, a Society for Neuroscience conference, for example. People are going to be presenting posters using all of these different techniques from the level of cellular and molecular techniques, genome techniques. There's structural techniques that we can now use to look at uh, the structure and architecture of the, of the different connectivity of different neurons in different brain regions. We have here a set of techniques on dynamic activities in neural networks, as well as manipulating the nervous system. At a more holistic systems level, we also have techniques for looking at animal behavior. And of course, my favorite set of techniques are computational techniques. That uh, really very much pertains to all of these, these different levels of description. So in the next video, what we're going to do is dive into a subset, a small subset of these techniques, a little more detail, because I really want you to understand how all of these different techniques work, because they're the most relevant ones to have a basic understanding of the next set of lectures on systems neuroscience and thinking about sensing and action and how all of those different systems function, both in relative isolation as well as when they're working together. I can't wait to get started with you.